Uh, thanks, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about Borgo, which is a new language I've been working on uh, for the past few years. We we'll look at uh, why I started working on this uh, language, and also I'll give you a um, tour of the language, and we'll look at uh, some pieces of code so you get an idea of what it looks like. Um, before we do, I'm Marco. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Salupe, which is a startup here in Italy. We're based in Milan, and we are uh, hiring, so feel free to uh, reach out if you're looking for a new job. Before you do, though, uh, one word of warning, we do not use uh, Rust uh, at my company. Uh, I think we use a way better technology that you might not have heard of, which is PHP and Laravel. And you might think, well, you probably have inherited a large code base in PHP, so it's difficult for you to switch to Rust. And no, that's not the case. Make no mistake, I wrote the first line of code, and I deliberately picked uh, PHP instead of Rust. So with that out of the way, you know, feel free to take with a grain of salt anything that comes after this. So my journey with Virgo started a few years back when I was writing uh, Haskell full time. And Haskell is a very complex language and it has a very broad surface. And I realized that to be productive in it, I had to stick with a smaller subset of the language, which I called the simple Haskell. And I found that subset of the language particularly ergonomic and uh, nice to work with. And that led me to write a book on simple Haskell where essentially we get to write a continuous integration server from scratch uh, in Haskell. But I kept thinking there must be you know, a better way for building applications uh, out there. And that's when I started uh, you know, thinking about writing my own language. And so the idea with this ideal language that I had in mind was that it was specifically targeted at building uh, applications. Uh, it had to have a good enough uh, type system with good uh, type inference. It had to have you know, good enough uh, performance. I was not concerned about you know, squeezing out every last bit of performance, uh, um, but it had to perform good enough. And lastly, it should have a good uh, package ecosystem because I didn't want to build one from scratch. And so garbage collection was not an issue here. Um, I did definitely didn't want to deal with uh, memory allocations uh, manually. Um, the first step when writing a new language is to pick uh, another language in which to write the compiler in. And so at the time, I hadn't write, written uh, Rust in production just yet, so I thought this was the perfect project to write some Rust uh, on a real-world uh, project. Uh, just like I did use simple Haskell when writing Haskell, I kind of did the same with Rust. And I, you know, the idea was to stick to a subset of Rust that I found easy to understand and was good enough for my needs. And that meant, you know, using clone deliberately with no regrets and uh, deliberately avoiding <laughs> lifetimes and most of the features of the borrow checker. And I guess nowadays you can call this easy mode Rust, which is sort of the same idea. Uh, but in my head, I just needed a better alternative to Haskell with some better tooling. Uh, the second step when building a new language is to decide to uh, what you want to use as a target. Um, I didn't want to target assembly directly or something like LLVM because that's too difficult. Instead, I decided to take the same approach that uh, many successful languages uh, took. So probably the most popular one example is TypeScript that successfully leveraged uh, the JavaScript uh, ecosystem. But there are other lesser known languages that I look up to, such as Clojure, Elm, and Elixir that also leveraged existing platforms to build on top. And so for my goals, uh, I thought that Go was actually the perfect candidate for this. Uh, Go has a great runtime. It has very good uh, performance. It has uh, concurrency built in. It has a, a very good garbage uh, collector. 
And at this point, it has a vast and stable package ecosystem that I could uh, tap into. And remember, this was from a few years back, so generics were kind of a new thing back then. And so the fact that Go supported uh, generics was definitely a plus for me. And being Go such a simple language, it makes for a great target for compilation because it's very easy to generate uh, code for it. There are also some things that I don't particularly like about Go, and this is debatable and probably uh, personal, but to me, uh, the things I wanted to improve upon were the fact that in Go, you don't get null safety. So it's very easy in Go to get nil pointers, and that's something that I wanted to improve on. Um, the fact that every other line in a Go code base seems to be checking for an error value was also something that I didn't particularly like, and I think I could, and I thought I could fix uh, pretty much in the same way that Rust did with the question mark operator. And at the end of the day, Go is just too imperative and it has little room for abstraction, so I thought I could uh, do something about that as well. So at this point, I kind of had a plan. Uh, I would take some features from Rust, mainly the syntax, which is, again, um, uh, subjective, but I really like uh, Rust syntax. Um, I would take algebraic data types and pattern matching, and in general, the type system and type inference from Rust, and the fact that option and result types are built in and then all the other features that we just saw from Go, and kind of merge the two and see what comes out. And this is how Borgo uh, came to be. So it's a Rusty language that uh, compiles to Go. And I'm, give you, I'm gonna give you some examples of real world uh, Borgo code now. So just like in Rust, in Borgo you can define um, enums, and then you can pattern match on all the constructors from uh, an enum. Uh, you can see that the syntax is very similar to Rust. Um, one notable example in Borgo is that you can skip semicolons, and the fully qualified name for a constructor is um, a little bit different from Rust, but other than that, um, I try to stay very close to Rust syntax. Um, the next thing that I really like about uh, Borgo is that by just using a couple of simple conventions, you can basically uh, bind to a most existing uh, Go code. And so in Go, it's very, um, uh, it's very popular to have functions that return this kind of uh, signature. So they either return a type T and then a Boolean that says is if the thing you were looking for uh, was actually found or not. And the Borgo compiler is able to automatically turn that in an option T. And similarly, when you have a Go function that returns either a type T or a pointer to an error, the Borgo compiler automatically turned that into a result. And so with this simple convention, it's very easy to use existing Go code. So for example here, we have the lookup env function from the OS package in the Go standard library, which takes a key that you want to look up in the environment, and then it returns the corresponding value if it's found in the environment. And in Borgo, it just becomes an option of string. And we can see an example here where we call the lookup env function, and then we just pattern match on the option as we do in Rust. Notice how in Borgo we can just uh, import uh, packages from the Go standard library, and it just works. Uh, the next example is the uh, HTTP GET function from the net HTTP package in Go. Uh, same thing, uh, the original Go function returns a response and then a pointer to an error, which may be nil. And in Go Borgo, this, uh, this is automatically converted to a result of a response. And so similarly, we can call this by you know, just calling the HTTP get function, and then we pattern match on the result by either dealing with the OK uh, variant or the error. Um, this is possible because in Borgo, we use um, uh, bindings, uh, just like you may be familiar with in uh, TypeScript. So these binding files are just 
um, contain all the definitions uh, from a specific package. In the case of TypeScript, this is bindings to existing JavaScript libraries. For Borgo, this is, these are bindings to existing Go packages. But the main difference with uh, TypeScript is that you can auto-generate these bindings because Go is uh, strongly typed, so we can have the Go compiler output uh, the function, uh, the type definitions for a certain functions, and then we can take those and automatically convert them to Borgo code. And you can see an example here of the regex package and the corresponding bindings that have been uh, automatically generated. Um, last example is uh, how we can use the question mark operator in Borgo, just like we do in Rust, to avoid a boilerplate in dealing with error handling. So in this function, we're calling the OS dot function uh, from Go. And typically in Go, you would have to explicitly handle the error case here. Whereas in Borgo, you can just use the question mark operator like you do in Rust. And so if you get an error out of this function call, it would short circuit and uh, return the error um, to the main uh, caller. Not, notice also here how, we, how you can use the fur in Borgo. Um, Borgo has no notion of a drop trait like we do in Rust, and there's no notion of a trait at all in Borgo for that matter. Um, semantically, Borgo is much closer to Go than to Rust, uh, which means that you'll see a lot of Goism in uh, Borgo code. Um, one last example to tie it all together. Here we're writing a very simple HTTP server in Borgo. And so starting from the top, we import some packages from the Go standard library. Then we define a counter struct with a mutex inside and a count property that keeps track of how many times the handler has been uh, uh, called. Then we define a method on our counter uh, type and the method uh, follows a very uh, popular, you know, you, you'll be familiar with this if you've used the Go a bit. This is the standard handler inter interface in Go. So we define a serve HTTP uh, method which takes a response and a request. The first thing we do is locking the mutex and then we defer the unlocking. Then we bump the counter and we write some stuff out to the response. And in the main function, all we have to do is initialize the counter. Uh, contrary to Go, in Borgo, you have to be explicit about the um, whenever you want to use a, a zero value for um, a specific property. And so Borgo has this built-in zero value uh, function that allows you to uh, use the zero value for a type. And then because we've correctly implemented the handler interface uh, for the HTTP package, we can just pass a reference to this uh, counter type to the listen and serve um, function. Um, if you're interested in building a compiler yourself, I suggest uh, at least looking at these uh, two algorithms, which are very straightforward but are very uh, cool, in my opinion. One has to do with parsing, and there's a very nice um, post by Matt Clad that goes through uh, Pratt parsing and gives you um, an implementation in Rust. It's very easy to follow, and it's very cool, in my opinion. The other one is algorithm W. Uh, if you've ever wondered how type inference and unification works in Rust, um, this is the core algorithm that's uh, beneath it, and a lot of the ML kind of languages uh, use this algorithm under, under the hood, so it's, again, a pretty cool exercise to uh, go through it. And if you feel a bit more uh, ambitious, there are three books in particular that I recommend when, uh, if you have an interest in writing uh, a compiler. And none of these have uh, Rust as the implementation language, but they're pretty easy to follow, and you can uh, write them in, uh, in Rust. Uh, in fact, one exercise I want to do in the short term is to follow along one of these books um, and implement them in Borgo, which leads to a kind of uh, interesting thought experiment, which is how do you write the compiler 
for um, for a new language. So you might be uh, aware that the Rust compiler is written in Rust, but like how was the first version of the Rust compiler written if Rust didn't exist? And so this is the this is what's commonly referred to as the bootstrap problem. So the first version of a compiler has to be written in another uh, language. And for Rust, that language was OCaml. So for the first few versions of Rust, um, you had um, the compiler written in OCaml instead of Rust itself. And this is interesting to me because Rust 1.0, or like the earlier versions of Rust, didn't look um, similar to what to the Rust we know uh, today. Rust back then was um, kind of different, and I know this because I uh, read about it. I've never used Rust back then, but from what, from what I can tell reading about the history of Rust, um, the first few versions were much more high level. Uh, Rust had a garbage collector, and it definitely didn't have a notion of a borrow checker. So it's kind of interesting to me that Rust started out as a language much closer to Borgo than what it was, what, what it is uh, today. And I think that speaks to the need uh, for a language like this for building applications. I think there's definitely a gap in the market for a language that can be, you know, similar to Rust but way less complex and more geared towards uh, building applications. And I hope Borgo can be uh, at least uh, an inspiration for the next language that will come out. So Borgo is available on GitHub. Please leave a star uh, if you find it interesting. And you can also play around with the online uh, playground. Um, the compiler is uh, compiled to WebAssembly there, so you can uh, you know, play around with Borgo code straight from your browser, you don't have to um, download anything. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the talk and thanks for listening. Marco San Pellegrini!